Welcome to Sprinkle with Hope podcast with your host, Jason. And today we are honored to have a neuroscientist, Dr. Doty, on with us today. Dr. Doty is a clinical professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford University School of Medicine. He's also the founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford. Uh, of which the Dalai Lama is a founding benefactor, which is really cool um, that Dr. Doty gets to to be with the Dalai Lama often. And so um, anyway, would you mind just kind of talking about maybe that relationship a little bit? And and uh, we'd love to hear. Uh, sure. So um, I've had an interest in this topic of compassion or uh, the recognition of another suffering with a motivational desire to alleviate that suffering. That's the definition uh, for some time. And I'm sure we'll talk about it later. Ultimately, it's because of my own background of suffering. And uh, as a result, I started this center at Stanford, which initially began as simply a project exploring this area. Interestingly enough, I actually had to pay scientists to do the research uh, in academic uh, areas. The study of compassion was really felt to be a waste of time. But ultimately, uh, with that initial uh, research work and a lot that has been done since, we now recognize that compassion not only is at the root of our humanity as a species, but which has allowed us to survive as a species. So based on that interest and that work, I started this center, and then one day I was walking through the Stanford campus, and I got this image of the Dalai Lama. And to be honest with you, I had no particular interest in the Dalai Lama, hmm. but this image stuck with me uh, to the point where uh, it popped into my head that uh, I should invite him uh, for a conference where we brought up uh, these uh, scientific studies we were doing on compassion. And that image was so strong that ultimately I tracked down an individual who was connected to him. And long story short, it resulted in an audience. And uh, as you can imagine, here is one of the world's icons uh, as a human being. And to be with him was quite extraordinary. But I told him what I was doing. And uh, he immediately understood. Uh, we had this long discussion. We were supposed to meet for 15 minutes. It turned into an hour and a half. And uh, not only did he immediately agree to uh, participate, but at the end of our conversation, his English translator, and he speaks English perfectly, but for complicated nuances, he'll communicate with his translator. <clears throat> um, they began this animated conversation in Tibetan. And uh, frankly, I thought I may have pissed off the Dalai Lama. <laughs> Nobody wants to piss off the Dalai Lama. But uh, anyway, uh, at the end of it, uh, Thupton Jinpa, his translator, turned to me and said, Jim, his holiness is so moved by this effort you've undertaken that he wants to make a donation. And at that time, he spontaneously made the largest donation he had ever made to a non-Tibetan cause. And really, that was uh, at our very first meeting. And mm -hmm. clearly, he and I connected. He came to uh, the event ultimately, and I've hosted him at several other events subsequently. And then actually I ended up being uh, the chairman of the Dalai Lama Foundation for a number of years. Wow, that, that is really cool. That's a great story. So do you go by James or Jim? Which, which one would you like us to call uh, you? In Europe, or, most people call me James. In the James. West, in the U.S., they call me Jim, but it can be any version you choose. Okay. <laughs> so you talk a lot about compassion. Tell us a little bit about what, what your studies have brought you to believe or, or discover about compassion. Sure. So, of course, um, if you look at the worst work of Karen Armstrong, who you may know as a former uh, nun who has written an immense amount about religion. Uh, she actually won the Ted Prize in 2008. And uh, what happened is she interviewed 19 spiritual and religious leaders about what is the core of every religion. And not surprisingly, that was compassion, as well as practicing the golden rule. And uh, there's a reason for that, uh, because uh, in the work that I have done and others have done, uh, it's been demonstrated scientifically that when one practices compassion towards others, 
it has a huge positive effect on your physiology and your brain. In regard to your brain, it stimulates those areas of your brain associated with reward and pleasure. Um, physiologically, it has a huge impact on cardiac function, uh, blood pressure, uh, the expression of inflammatory proteins, it decreases those. And inflammatory proteins are frequently associated with chronic disease states. It affects the release of stress hormones, such as cortisol, in a positive way, and uh, it decreases them. And then uh, it boosts your immune system. And these are also effects uh, that have been associated with meditative type of practices. Mm. So Amazingly, uh, when one practices compassion, the science demonstrates that it offers more benefit than exercise and uh, being at your ideal body weight. Now, that's not to uh, diminish the importance of those, but it's to demonstrate to you how powerful these types of practices are. Uh, so it's really quite extraordinary. Now, I should also say, though, that for many people, especially in the West and modern society, uh, we are very critical of ourselves. Uh, yeah. Oftentimes we'll say, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. It's not possible. I'm an imposter in my job. And uh, uh, this, of course, has a huge negative effect on what you can accomplish. Because once you say, I can't, or it's not possible, by definition, that becomes reality. And so one of the important aspects of this is compassion for self. And there's an immense amount of work that has been done by Chris Germer and Kristen Neff on this topic that demonstrates how important this is. Um, the problem is that in modern society, unlike how we lived a few hundred years ago, when we lived in small villages, we were born there, died there, lived in these intergenerational households. Everyone knew us from the time we were a child to our death. Well, the extraordinary thing in those environments was that regardless, these people knew the good and the bad, and they still loved you. In modern society, unfortunately, uh, many of us are not uh, in contact with closely or uh, living with a, a parent or a grandparent. Uh, our siblings are not in proximity, and we're in oftentimes stressful jobs. And the problem is that in those situations, you don't really have anybody to turn to. And in fact, a quarter of people will tell you that when they're in pain or suffering, that they do not have a single person to talk to. Mm. And sadly, what happens is that then we get, have a tendency to create this projection of how we want people to see us. You know, I am a neurosurgeon. I'm a neuroscientist. I do this. I do that. Blah, 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 blah. And uh, this is uh, because we're afraid of being judged if we show our authenticity. Mm. And of course, when you do that, the other person does it back to you and you never truly authentically connect. And of course, this is because all of us are afraid of being judged and not being accepted for who we are. That being said, if you look at a study that was done by Google, as an example, to uh, assess what makes a successful team in the corporate environment, what did they find? They spent three years, $50 million to find that what makes a successful team is having a leader who is authentic, mm -hmm. who does show his vulnerability, uh, someone who is non-judgmental, someone who is accepting, uh, someone who does not criticize you for failure. And uh, fundamentally, this is what all of us want in life, to be accepted for who we are uh, which includes those parts of us that we're not necessarily proud of, uh, those parts of us that um, aren't perfect. And, uh, uh, and that's very hard for a lot of people. But once you're able to give compassion to yourself, you can then look out in the world and understand that everyone is suffering and everyone uh, deserves uh, to not be judged. They deserve to be accepted and to manifest those things that really make us human. And this is, uh, though, really, really hard. It's interesting. I give lectures all the time, and I have no problem uh, tearing, or, or telling a, a story to someone. And, you know, my voice will break or I'll shed a tear. 
then that's fine. Yeah. But as soon as I do that, everyone breaks up and starts crying, right? And the reason that is, is because they want permission to allow their feelings to come to the surface. And so often in modern society, they feel intimidated or that's not possible. And by doing that, by showing my own vulnerability, it allows them to show theirs. That's awesome. You, you said some really, really great things. And I, I'm kind of curious in your studies, have you found that when you show compassion to another, does it also then, uh, you know, the person receiving the compassion, does it also uh, help alleviate some of those things like the blood pressure and, and those other things that you were sure. talking about? Well, look, I, I mean, one of the biggest detriments to our health is the presence of fear and anxiety. So when you're kind, when you're compassionate, when you embrace another, that creates what we call an environment of psychological safety. And this then allows the person to shift from being in the stress mode, the flight, fight, fear, or freeze mode, to shift over to uh, engagement of their parasympathetic nervous system, which is what we call a rest and digest system. And when you're in this mode, this actually not only has the positive physiologic effects I mentioned, but also results in you having access to that part of your brain called the executive control area. And this is associated with much more thoughtful discerning judgment because you're not afraid, you're not just trying to survive. It allows for more creativity and ultimately more productivity. So yes, uh, mm -hmm. creating that environment, a compassionate, uh, non-judgmental, caring environment has a profound, profound effect on uh, the other. And I'm sure you appreciate there's a huge difference if you're, let's say, in a, a, a conference room waiting for somebody to come in and the difference between somebody coming and say, hey, how are you? Hey, it's great to see you. You're looking good. Hey, fantastic. Wonderful day out. I'm so happy versus a guy who comes in sullen with his arms crossed <laughs> acting like a jerk. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> You know, I mean, it's it, the contrast is immediate, right? I mean, yeah. if that first person comes in, you're like, going, hey, this is cool. You know, I feel okay. I'm ready to go versus the other. You're immediately intimidated or you're suspicious and you're not going to be your best. Yeah, that's really cool. So are there things that you're currently working on, any studies that you're doing or any anything that you're looking forward to in the very near future? Well, yeah. Um, we just published an article on the uh, compassion, motivation, and action scoring, which is uh, uh, a mechanism uh, to assess compassion uh, during further scientific studies, which there hasn't been one until now. So that's wonderful. Um, we recently uh, uh, published a paper on, again, uh, the MRI and um, so the imaging studies, as well as the physiologic effects of um, acting compassionately, that was published in Nature recently. Um, so uh, yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff. That's awesome. Do you do uh, do you do stuff with neuroplasticity and how that compassion affects that as well? Or, or? sure. Uh, well, first of all. Um, neuroplasticity, you know, is a term that's bandied around by a lot of people. And we know that through repetition and intention, you can create or uh, strengthen neural pathways. And now that can be for good or bad. Uh, mm -hmm. But in regard to specifically compassion, we know that, uh, you know, the more you do it, uh, not only the better you feel, but the better the other feels because, you know, these types of positive actions have a rippling effect uh, not only on yourself, but for others around you. It's interesting. Uh, we uh, have a compassion cultivation training program, which we've developed over the last number of years. And it's really quite extraordinary because I can't tell you the number of spouses who've come up to me after their spouse has taken the course, they go, you know, it's amazing, uh, uh, completely different person. Uh, we sp talk and uh, exchange uh, ideas much better. He's much more open. He's not snappy. He's not judgmental. It's affected me. It's affected our children. So uh, yes, I mean, uh, these types of practices are profound because we have a tendency to be reactive to events around us. 
And what I mean by that is we have an immediate reaction. And that's because we're wired to um, respond to perceived threat. And uh, of course, in modern society, our reactions are not necessarily correct in those instances. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, what I tell people is uh, that prior to a reaction, you should pause. So this is this idea uh, of a pause between stimulus and response. And it's been quoted that uh, within that pause lies your freedom. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that uh, individuals who practice this, instead of being reactive, they're much more thoughtful and discerning if they pause for six seconds before reacting. And this can have a huge, huge effect. Uh, because first of all, once that period of time happens, you no longer have that intense emotional state, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can think much more clearly about, about what the right action should be. As an example, if you're driving along, and I'm sure it's happened to you where somebody's cut you off, <laughs> uh, almost caused an accident, right? And typically you have two responses. One is a hand gesture, <laughs> and one is uh, perhaps two words. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but, you know, and of course you're angry. You think, God, that guy's selfish. He's rude. He's cutting in front of the line, whatever it is. And, and you think the guy's a jerk, right? But if I reframe this experience for you to say, well, you know, the guy who cut you off, he didn't mean to do so. His wife's uh, in the front seat. She's nine months pregnant. She's broke her water. She's bleeding. He's uh, trying to get her to the hospital. Well, of course, you're going, oh, my God, of course, I understand, you know, let me, you know, help you, I'll, I'll you know, follow you or, or drive you there, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in a microsecond, your whole feeling has changed here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not angry at the guy, you're going, oh, my God, if that was me, what would I do, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we don't know what motivated that other person to do something, right? And, and so it costs you nothing to give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and actually it makes you feel better, you know, and frankly, you know, if somebody cuts me off, life's not that too important to get upset about it. Right? <laughs> yeah. right? I, I mean, it's just, it's just meaningless. You know, I, I will drive with my son who's 17 and he'll go, I can't believe that person cut us off. Dad. And I go, it gives us more time to talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, so, so all of these things, which we think are important or which we react to are often completely unimportant. In fact, you know, it's funny uh, and you're probably not old enough yet, but what you'll find is that things that irritated you and you thought were so, so important at the time are completely meaningless uh, because what's important is love, caring for another, being present, and all these other minor issues uh, don't mean anything. You know, it's interesting to look at the how a person, as they get older, you know, when you're in your 30s or 40s, you know, you keep your house all neat, everything is perfect, you get the lawn mode, everything has to be here and there, and then <laughs> as you get older, you realize it's just not that big of a deal. And, you know, the things you thought of having the furniture perfect or having no hair on the floor or blah, 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 it really doesn't mean a whole lot. And it's not to say that, you know, you, you don't try to be neat and things, but these little things that you think, uh, you know, are so critically important are nothing. You know, in my own house before, uh, so I was married, divorced for uh, several years and remarried and now I have, I had a, an older daughter, but I have two boys who are 17 and, and 12. And, uh, you know, I was fairly um, fastidious regarding paintings that I had and uh, antiques that I had collected and uh, et cetera. And so, you know, I have an office and one of the things that I have is what's called a trefin, which is an antique device for making a hole in your skull. So, you know, I collect these types because I'm a neurosurgeon. Sure. And so, you know, uh, this is on my desk in this place of honor with some other knickknacks. And, you know, I 
can't find it. And then I find my, and he was probably six at the time, using it on a piece of wood and you know, it's like <laughs> 150 years old <laughs> on a piece of wood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to make a hole. Oh, and, you know, I mean, I immediately like, you know, go live it. And then, uh, you know, that's, it, it's, it's an interesting lesson that your children teach you. There, many things aren't that important. And, uh, you know, I uh, had a actually another, uh, which was a cup that was probably 250 years old. And it had this beautiful um, writing on it. it was from England. And it actually, it was a piece of that I actually valued. And my son accidentally knocked it over and it broke. And uh, again, you know, I had this welling anger and, uh, um, and then I had to let it go. And, yeah. uh, you know, has my life dramatically changed since that broke? No, no. Yeah. Right. And, uh, uh, and so this is like so many things. So you have to sort of not think that either you're at the center of the world or everything you think is at the center of the world or everything you value is frankly that important. And so once you're able to let that go, um, in some ways you're liberated, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that this is one of the challenges for people is sort of that acceptance and letting go. You know, you see these people who are OCD types who everything has to be in the perfect place and they get all angry and upset. And I, I sympathize with them because of the challenges for some of them they can't control. But there are other people who are just controlling people as a way to manipulate and control people. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, none of those things are that important at the end of the day. Yeah. So is there something specific that happened to you in your life or maybe a time in your life where you thought I'm more interested in learning about compassion and, and sort of going that way with your career or as you grew up, was it just you wanted to learn more about it? No, uh, uh, who we are today is a manifestation of our past. And for many people, events in one's childhood has a profound, profound effect on who they become. And that's for good or bad. You know, if you've grown up in an environment where you've been abused or punished unfairly, oftentimes, um, these types of children will become bullies. You know, they're in pain and unfortunately they uh, act out um, because of their own pain that they're suffering. And so for myself, <clears throat> I grew up in poverty. Uh, my family was on public assistance my entire life. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. Uh, my mother had had a stroke when I was a child and partially paralyzed seizure disorder chronically depressed, attempted suicide multiple times. And uh, we were evicted from different residences. And so uh, in some ways, I grew up at the other end of compassion. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is here you are suffering, you're poor, you're having challenges, and the system is not compassionate oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so what intrigued me was you know, what motivates or makes somebody be not compassionate versus compassionate. And then ultimately at the age of 12, where I had a sense of hopelessness, despair, anger, fear, uh, I walked into a magic shop. And you mentioned my book earlier, Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. Uh, when I walked into that magic shop, I was greeted by a woman in her 50s who had this incredible smile that was radiant, that embraced you, and uh, uh, we began a conversation. And it turned out that it was her son's store, and she knew nothing about magic in the store. She just happened to be visiting and was uh, there while her son ran an errand. But it led to us having a discussion, and after about 20 or 30 minutes, she said to me, I really like you. I'm here for another six weeks. If you come in every day, I can teach you something that I think could help you a lot. And uh, I did show up and it wasn't because I had any insight or self-awareness because I was 12. I showed up because I had absolutely nothing else to do and she <laughs> cookies, <laughs> Yeah. right? So I did show up and what she taught me over this period of time was a 
meditation or mindfulness practice of breathing and relaxing and focusing. And of course, to learn to evolve, you have to be present and you have to be attentive. And when you grow up in an environment like, excuse me, like mine, where you have something called adverse childhood experiences, which you may have heard of, you know, poverty, drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness, all of these profoundly in a negative way affect a child's ability to uh, have a successful life in the future. And uh, um, so she taught me this ability to attend. And then she taught me uh, that the negative voice going on in my head, which I alluded to earlier, uh, was a false narrative that it was uh, created because of evolutionary baggage that we have, where things that put us at risk, we have a tendency to hold on to or they stick to us uh, for that obvious reason. But unfortunately, the side effect of that is negative commentary or things we pick up that are negative very much sticks to us as well. So these false narratives, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, result in many of us uh, limiting uh, our uh, possibilities. And uh, I always tell people it's like a, uh, every time you think of a negative thought, it's like putting a brick down that creates a prison for you. Mm -hmm. And the walls get higher, it gets narrower, it gets darker, and your view of possibilities rapidly diminishes. So she made me understand that and taught me to change my narrative which is acceptance, that I'm worthy, that I'm good, that I'm worthy of love, et cetera, et cetera. And that changes everything. <clears throat> uh, so uh, once I was able to change that negative dialogue to one of positivity, it liberated me uh, to understand the reality that I have immense power, as all of us do, and that many things um, uh, we can believe in are in fact possible because of our own inherent power. You know, when you believe these false narratives, in some ways, it's giving your power away. Mm -hmm. And so once you realize this, and once you realize that you have agency in regard to what happens to you, then that starts changing everything. And this is this idea of uh, manifesting your intention. So she taught me to relax. She taught me to, if you will, tame my mind and deal with these negative comments. She taught me how to uh, open my heart or be compassionate to others. And she taught me how to manifest my intentions, all of which are extraordinarily powerful tools uh, to improve oneself. And uh, I listened to her and it allowed me to believe that I could go to college, could go to medical school, uh, to become a professor at Stanford, uh, to be a successful entrepreneur, to be an author. And uh, uh, so I'm eternally grateful to this uh, woman. And the other thing it did was it changed, allowed me to change my perspective of who I am and what I could do. And also, as an example, to look at my parents in a different way. I used to have a lot of anger and hostility because mm -hmm. I felt neglected, I felt abandoned, I felt that they didn't really love me. But what I came to realize is that they did not have the tool set to deal with their own issues, their own pain, their own suffering. And as a result, they were so involved with their issues that they just didn't have the tool set uh, to overcome them and uh, to focus on me or my brother and sister. And so uh, I had no more anger at all. Mm -hmm. And I, what I tell people is that when you change how you look at the world uh, and how you react to events, that changes how the world reacts to you. And so once I change from being angry and having despair and the sense of hopelessness and change my energy to one of positivity and optimism, that's then how the world uh, reacted to me and allowed me to accomplish what I've accomplished. And you know, it's interesting because you'll see as an example, people in the tech world that who've you know, become extraordinarily wealthy, they'll say, I, 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 I. There is no I. We cannot survive as human beings unless we rely on other people and unless people help us. And there's nothing that I've accomplished in my life without an immense amount of help from tons of people, and I fully acknowledge that. And uh, uh, that 
help has allowed me to do what I've done. And so when you look at the world through that lens, it allows you to be much more thoughtful, much more generous, much more kind, uh, much more forgiving. That's awesome. I, I love that, that thought, you know, and it's, it's, it is true. I think it's that, you know, that narrative that we tell ourselves is that's what we're going to, you know, whether it's a negative narrative or hopefully a positive narrative, but that is what we're going to become. And, and uh, that's awesome that this woman took the time to have that compassion and be with you. And, you, you know, where she was just trying to fill in, you know, for her son and, and be in this magic shop. It's, it's, it's really neat that, that, you know, humanity still has those things, right. Those, that compassion in them and, and that she took the time to, to be with you at such a young age, you know, 12, that's, you're kind of going everywhere, right. That <laughs> hard to sit still. And well, and of course, you know, at that age, you're very impressionable and things yeah. go the other direction, right. In a very yeah. negative way. And certainly that was possible for me. Uh, but I think the other aspect of this is to understand that each of us uh, really, uh, regardless of our position, power, wealth, have the ability to positively affect one person's life every day. Mm. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't have any money. I don't have this. I don't have that. A smile sometimes is enough to change someone's life. And so looking at the world through that lens, uh, I think uh, also changes everything. Each of us can be an agent uh, of compassion and uh, we just have to understand that. And what's amazing is when you carry that with you, um, in some ways it unlocks other people, it motivates people, it makes them see the positive part of life. And you know, in modern society, unfortunately, uh, by the nature of how media works, the negative things stick to us. Therefore, media focuses on the negative. Uh, the fact of the matter is actually, most people in this world are good people. Most people uh, want positive things to happen. Most people, given the right encouragement, uh, want to do better. And uh, that's really, uh, I think, a truth. You know, oftentimes when we here, as an example, certain politicians promoting, you know, hate divisiveness, um, you know, unfortunately, a subset of people will respond to that negative narrative. And it's really sad, because oftentimes, these are hurting people. And uh, by attaching to that anger and hate, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't help them. It just, you uh, uh, gives them sort of a little bit that makes them feel good briefly, like a bully, uh, but it doesn't solve the problem and they're still empty and hurting inside. And so I think that by getting away from that type of narrative to one of positivity and encouragement, it can have really a profound, profound effect. Yeah, that's I, awesome. I agree. I think in your case, it was simply this woman's time and her knowledge that she was sharing with you that really did impact your life. And I know thousands of people that, that you've impacted as well. Um, you know, it could be simple as a smile or something like that, even time spent with the person. So we, we've come to a point in, in the show that we've called the double down dose. So Jason has a question for you and then I'll have a question for you. Sure. So Dr. Doty, what, what is your definition of hope or what, what, what would you say about hope? Hope contains all the possibilities that manifest a good life for each of us as well as a good life for everyone around us. That's, that's very, very good. <laughs> we love asking these questions. Um, I think sometimes often we don't think about those type of things. We just, you know, we don't think about them on the level that you just uh, shared with us. So the second part of Double Down Dose, um, how would you define passion? 
Uh, I think it's the extraordinary energy that is associated with a cause that hopefully is one that benefits humanity. That's awesome. <laughs> Such good. Such good information. Really, Dr. Doty, I appreciate you coming on with us. This has been really insightful. I love your story. I love you know, just what you're doing, spreading compassion in the world is, is so needed right now, especially it seems like, you know, we're in a difficult time and people are, you know, have anxiety levels have gone up, depression, all those things, and we can show more compassion. So I love, you know, love the work that you're doing. I appreciate it. Um, and so I'm sure so do many, many thousands of people. Well, thank you. For anyone who's interested, you can go to the website for the center I run at Stanford on Compassion. Uh, it's ccare, C-C-A-R-E dot Stanford dot edu. Uh, you can certainly track down my book into the magic shop, uh, which is now in 40 languages and editions. And, uh, uh, and also uh, you can uh, find out a little bit more about me at jamesrdotymd.com. And if you have a specific question, issue, uh, feel free to email me at jrdoty, uh, D-O-T-Y at stanford.edu. So uh, thank you for allowing me to be with you. I wish you and all of your listeners the best. And uh, never forget that it's within your power to improve someone's life every day. <laughs>